Hi. Okay. I thought I'd do this study guide for you guys, just in case you need a little brush up. Some of you guys have asked for something, okay? And that's fine. Um, remember that all the multiple choice on this on the final will be from your units one and two examinations. There's only ten of them. There'll be three or four short answers, and they'll be covering things like color theory. Let's start with that. Complementary colors, red and green, blue and orange, yellow and purple. They're on opposite sides of the color with each other, but they contrast and fight against each other. And, but they can also work very beautifully together. Okay, Analogous colors are those color families that are closely related. Uh, red to yellow and all the oranges in between. Yellow to blue and all the greens in between. That's another analogous color family. And blue to red and all the purples in between. That's analogous colors. Monochromatic, one color. And then the primaries and secondaries. Know your or ephemeral elements uh, well enough to use them when you need to during your analysis. Okay. Um, for shortening, remember that's, the, that's the, that extreme uh, like the fist in the face, something coming right out at you visually, okay? It's meant to be impactful, all right? That's for shortening. There's color. Different kinds of pencils. The higher the B to 1B, 3B, 5B, 6B, 9B, the softer the lead, the darker the mark. The higher the H, 2H, 4H, 5H, 9H, the harder the lead, and the more it just will not make it, the, the lighter the mark. The higher the number on that H, the lighter the mark it will be, okay? The differences between oil and water-based paints, and I hope for the last time, okay. Oil-based paints dry slow, have beautiful, rich color, and are worked and are cleaned with mineral spirits, which makes them flammable and caustic. Oil-based paints, examples of those, oils, enamels, spray paints, and some inks. Water-based paints dry fast. They are worked and cleaned up with water, and they have color quality that tends to be a little less rich, a little flatter. Okay, Types of water-based water paints are watercolor, acrylic, tempera, gouache, fresco. Okay, um, There's no such thing as thinness or thickness. There's no such thing as what's easier to work with. I don't see any of that. Or durability. Scratch it. Okay? That lots of other factors play into all those things. The entire process for creating a Raku pot that's listed there. Know those words. Okay. The three basic printmaking categories. Relief. Relief. That's where you carve into something. And the raised part is inked and prints. Types of relief print making are stamping, lino cut, done with linoleum, and wood cut. Okay. The second main category is intaglio, spelled intaglio. Okay. Intaglio. That's where you take usually a metal plate and you you etch into it, you engrave into it, you acid bath it, whatever. You make marks into that metal plate. Then you put the ink inside the carved or the incised marks. That's what prints. Types of intaglio printmaking are, well, that we discussed, mezzotint, etching, engraving, aquatint. Okay. The third main category is Planography. Looks like planography. Planography. That is anything done on a flat surface. Any printmaking done on a flat surface. That's it. Types of planography. Silkscreen, photo silkscreen, and lithography. Okay? 
The seven steps of lost wax casting for sculpture. Remember the big bronze warrior guy? They're listed right there. Impasto. Impasto is that thick application of paint. Okay. So much so that the surface has got those ridges and rays of the paint. Okay, think Van Gogh. That's impasto. All right. Intarsia is that very thin piece of wood veneer that have been mosaically sort of inlaid together to give you the impression maybe of a, a pattern or a three-dimensional space when there is none. Think of the Ducal Palace of the of Urbino, you know, the, the, the library. That's intarsia. Okay. That's under uh, crafts. That's lecture 18. And photomontage. Photomontage is done in the dark room where you actually splice together negatives, put it in the film developing machine, and develop your single print. Photo collage is where you actually take photographs, physical things, cut them up, rip them up, whatever, and glue them down on something. That's a photo collage, or that's any type of collage. All right, the Candy Wiley film. I've made an extra credit question for that. Those of you who have seen it, good for you. All right, let's talk about some of the slides. King Mankara and his queen. All right. He is realistically portrayed here. I mean, it's a three-dimensional man and his wife, okay? But you wouldn't say that it was very detailed, would you? There's no texture of the skin, there's no age, there's no sagging, right? They're looking fully frontal at us, and they're very stiffly sort of portrayed. There's not a lot of movement in this piece on purpose, okay? That, that's what I mean by static when I say that on the slide. There's a reason behind that. The Pharaoh is a god king on earth and will eventually become a god, if he's judge worthy, in the afterlife. He must be eternal. That's why the static, that's why the stiffness. He must be all-powerful. And he must be perfect. He's a god. Okay? That's why there's no blemish, there's no age. Matter of fact, they look almost exactly the same for 3,000 years. All the sculptures of all the portrayals of the, of the Pharaoh and his queen. Okay? That is because... They are governed, artists are governed in ancient Egypt by a set of artistic laws that govern how the Pharaoh and his queen and all that are supposed to be portrayed. So many proportionally, so many cubits high or palms high and wide, no uh, texture, no blemish, no mar. He must be perfect. He must be powerful. Notice that the forms, we've really got just tubes. They're very stylized, very simplified. That's part of that look for perfection, okay? And that one foot that he's got in front is the foot of authority, that foot of power. He will always have that foot in front of him. As opposed to, know your humanism, the Greeks. The ancient, this is a piece by, from ancient Greece called the Doriphoros. Of Polyclitos. Polyclitos is the artist. Let me say that again. Polyclitos is the artist. And this is ancient Greece. This is celebrating the ideal physical human body form. Okay? Remember, humanism is a celebration of the possibility of perfection in man, physically, academically, intellectually athletically, in all forms. Polyclitos develops a set of artistic laws in the pursuit of that ideal, that ideal human. Where the ancient Egyptians were interested in the perfect God, the ancient Greeks are interested in the perfect human. Therefore, he, Polyclitos develops a set of artistic and mathematical, actually, laws that govern proportion symmetry, texture, everything, and how everyone's going to be portrayed. This is not a portrait of a particular man. This is an ideal. He's in, though, a pose that Polyclitos has developed. Contraposto. Know that word. You'll need to know it. 
That's that slightly askewed shoulder to hip at opposite angles, one leg straight and one leg bent. That sort of looks like he's taking a step. Okay. Move on, woman. There we go. Patrician carrying the death mask of his ancestors. The Romans, this is ancient Rome. Ancient Rome. The Romans take all the style and the contraposto and the humanism and everything from Greek art, but they change it. They embrace it, but they make it their own by adding something called truth. This is a real man. He's aged. He uh, looks like me. He's got little jowls kind of hanging a little bit. He's kind of old. He's bald. He's not the most attractive, ideal human. You wouldn't call him that. That changes him differently than the Dory Foros. He also is clothed. He's in contraposto, but he's carrying the death mask of his ancestors. Why? Remember the Kennedy analogy. This is a patrician. He wants to uh, solidify his political and social status. He's promoting himself here. This is a bid for power and social legitimacy. Because of what my father and my grandfather did, I have the right to be a senator and a patrician of Rome. Okay, He's building on their good name. Oh, yeah. The Gothic. Remember, deny the body to save the soul. This is the age of faith. All right? Know this. There's your floor plan for a, a Roman Catholic cathedral. And the flying buttresses therein. And the upper windows are called clerestory windows in a Gothic cathedral. They let in natural light. They're stained glass windows, yes, but on the very top register, there's going to be usually a set of open air windows that will let in that natural light as well. Okay, all right. Renaissance, we talked about that. Okay, so let's talk about going from the Middle Ages or the Gothic to the Renaissance. Well, what is the Renaissance? Well, the Renaissance is a rebirth. That's what that word means, a Renaissance of humanism. After a thousand years of living in the Dark Ages and the Gothic and the Age of Faith, humanism is not going to be outlawed anymore like it was then. So when we look at these artworks, we say, well, the Gothic icon from Spain of David slaying Goliath, okay, is flat. It's two-dimensional shape, line, pattern, color. It's meant to decorate. It's a gothic icon. So it's telling the story of David slaying Goliath visually to a populace and a congregation that cannot read. It's also meant to decorate the place in which it's painted on. This is a fresco, but whether it's an, a, a gold icon or whatever, it's meant to be decorative. It's meant to also be spiritually and lift, uplifting, beautiful. But it's also meant to instruct. But there's no, why it's so two-dimensional and flat is because we are denying the, literally, the three-dimensional physical aspect of humans by making them look flat. We're taking it even out of our art. Does that make sense? We are denying the flesh so much that in our art, we're not even going to reference our three-dimensionality at all. That's why this Gothic icon looks this way. And that's why they looked that way for a thousand years. That's age of faith. On the other side, we've got two other Davids. But these are from the Renaissance, Italy. Italian Renaissance, both of these pieces. Both of them are Davids. One's by Donatello in the middle and Michelangelo's on the very far well, right or left, whatever way you're looking. Anyway, they are in contraposto, just like what they're borrowing from the ancient Greeks. They are meant to be idealistic. They're perfectly proportioned. One's a young youth and one's the over-musculatured adult male, okay, from Michelangelo. But they are meant to look symmetrical and in the Italian idea of physical beauty in the male. 
here. Okay. But notice how calm and cool they are under fire. The Donatello one in the middle here, he looks down to, at the dead Goliath. He's actually standing on his head. So we've watched him after the battle, and he looks perfectly composed, doesn't he? As he looks down in contrapposto pose, with that perfect smooth texture of his skin, very calmly assessing his dead foe. Michelangelo's David is also symmetrically, beautifully composed, physically, all the muscles laid out so. And he's in contraposto as well, as he looks off at the Goliath very calmly in the distance. He's getting ready to, to kill him. But notice his hands are out of proportion. Why? They're slightly larger than they should be. Because he's getting ready to kill him with them. Kill Goliath with his hands. And what is that filled with? The presence of God. The power of God is in his hands. Stored up for battle. Remember that David and Goliath tale is a miracle. Here's a teenager that kills a Goliath, a giant, with one stone in his pocket. Well, in his sling. Or we have our next slide here when we look at the very far right. Bernini's David here. This is from the Baroque. The Baroque period. Okay? Which is all about the ultimate moment. The dramatic moment when something's going to happen. So we all, all in all Baroque artwork, you're going to see movement. You're going to see action. Because something's happening. After the coolness of the Renaissance, the Baroque wanted to talk about emotion and action. So, Bernini has got David here again, but he's getting, just getting ready to launch that stone. Look at the twist of the diagonal form in the body, the legs, even echoed in the drapery around his midsection and around his torso. Okay, He's bent over. He is getting ready to launch it. And look at the face. His grimace. He is focusing in. He is getting all of his determination and might ready to launch that stone. We're looking at the very moment when he's getting ready to launch it. Okay, back to the Renaissance. This is the Last Judgment from Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, Italian Renaissance. Take a look at it. Look at Christ. He is super muscular. He is beyond muscular. It's not believable anymore. Okay, practically he's so over-muscled. Matter of fact, all the saints and people around him, his father, his mother, all the apostles, everybody up there, martyrs, they're all completely powerfully built. Look at the out-of-proportion arm on the Christ that he's getting ready to judge humanity. That is the, that is a powerful God. And he's getting ready to judge you and get judge everybody here. And he looks like it. But they're all filled with that over-musculature physique. Because they're filled with the presence and power of God. Look at the color that they're in. In the sky and in, the, in, their, in their, some of their clothing draperies and things like that. It's very pure, isn't it? It's very rich, idealized color, right? That's the Italian Renaissance, all right? Ideal. Here's the Gothic version of the Last Judgment. We have hierarchical scale, where Christ is at the very top register with the apostles and his mother and father there. And then there's the saints and cherubims and the angels. And then the saved are sort of over here in the midsection. At the very bottom are the damned in the fires of hell. This is all gold gilt. But there's no space. There's not even a real landscape. It, these are simply flat two-dimensional shapes of people delineated with a strong contour line floating in a sea of gold telling a story preaching adorning and glittering beautiful okay the age of faith all right and then we're going to talk lastly hopefully about the Italian versus the northern renaissance they're both interested in the Renaissance. They're both all Renaissance people. This is Raphael's crucifixion, Italian Renaissance. Christ here is in a symmetrical composition, but he looks rather composed, doesn't he? He looks rather healthy even. You he might even look asleep as he is on the cross. The people below him are looking up rather calmly at him, peacefully. 
He is in a beautiful Italian landscape with deep atmospheric perspectives showing this deep space, beautiful ideal color of this gorgeous day. Okay, The angels on either side of the Christ are lyrically dancing in their movement of their bodies and their, their lyrical line of their sashes, everything as they capture the blood of Christ. This is a celebration that he is risen for these people, for the Italians. This is why everyone looks so cool and happy and there's not a whole lot of death and and uh, the sadness of the situation. This is afterwards. This is the, the positive uh, message of the crucifixion and a portrayal that is typical of the Italian. Ideal, perfect, and a little bit cool, a little bit in, in, in emotion and reserved. As opposed to this, the Eisenheim Altarpiece by Grunwald. This was a chapel piece, an altarpiece that went into a hospital for people who suffered from chronic, horrible skin diseases. Okay, so let's take a look at the let's look at the difference here. This is the same time period, but this is the Northern Renaissance, and they've got a different sensibility. They're interested in humans. They're interested in humanism. But they're interested in telling the truth of the story. So here we have Christ. He is actually dead. He looks dead. He's emaciated. His arms are twisted at least 360 degrees. The fingers are splayed. The skin is peeling off of him. The texture is and they're all down his body. He's slightly greenish yellow. He looks dead. And he looks like he's been tortured, doesn't he? Yes. He is dead, so it's even though it's the afternoon, the time of day looks like night. That's true to the Bible story. We are actually in the Middle East, in the landscape, not some Italian landscape. This is the real Middle East being portrayed. This is the truth of what the event was supposed to be like. The Virgin Mary swoons in anguish and grief. Mary Magdalene as well, wailing. Notice there are other hallmarks to the Northern Renaissance here. The extreme focus and fine detail portrayed in the hair, in the column uh, tops. There, every little, every little detail is going to be painted like it looks like it's painted with one hair brush kind of a thing. Also, we have the symbolism of the Lamb of God present underneath uh, the Christ figure here. He's actually got holding the crucifix and he's stepping on top of the chalice. That's typical of the Northern Renaissance as well. The ideal of the Italians versus the truth, warts and all, of the North, Northern Renaissance. Okay. There you go. Oh, one last thing about the Eisenheim altarpiece. Very important. His skin is peeling on this piece because it's a part, it's going into that skin hospital for people that's suffering with skin problems, right? If you're a sufferer and you're looking up at this particular image, you know that Christ knows your suffering. And you are reminded of what he went through at the same time. That is most important. That connection between sufferer and the Christ and the Christ and the sufferer. Okay? That's important to the artwork. Oh, yes. This is a Baroque piece. Remember? Drama. So, an action and the ultimate moment. So, we've got... The movement conveyed and everyone being uh, that complete strong diagonal, the cross, the figures, Christ, even the linear parts of the ropes and things like that. Everything echoes that diagonal movement, that thrust. We have that strong tenebrism on Christ himself. Okay, He is literally being lowered into the ground at this ultimate moment, being crucified. The Frida Kahlo. Art and personal expression, the two Fridas. Frida Kahlo had a singular life, and her artwork is totally her own. She only portrayed, she only really did self portraits for her entire career, talking about her life and where she was mentally, emotionally, and physically. Um, she suffered from that polio as a young child and then was in that bus accident that broke nearly every bone in her body. She spent her entire life 
in a body cast or in a brace or in a wheelchair from basically about the rib cage down. She wears that costume that she's portrayed in here, the two dresses, because she's celebrating her Mexican and her German heritage. The German heritage in the green. She holds in this piece, in the green on, on the green side of this, an amulet of her husband, soon to be ex-husband. Diego Rivera. She's married to him, but they're divorcing at this very moment. On the other side of the piece, you see the Frida in the white dress. White wedding, maybe. But notice the two hearts that are being portrayed. One closed towards the viewer and one open. And the one that's open is bleeding all over that white wedding dress. What do you think Frida Kahlo feels about her divorce that's impending at this time when this piece is painted? Not very happy. Her blood is spilling on her wedding dress. She's in pain. Emotional pain and physical pain. That's always part of her pieces. Emotional and physical pain. She's never out of pain, physically. They show this strong bond between these two women because the artery joins them. This is a symmetrically composed, almost fully frontal painting with lots of personal symbolism. Almost all of her work is imbued, filled with personal symbolism, which makes this work all about her, and it's singular to her. Last but not least, the David's, well, the David Smith's not big. It, just remember, art for art's sake. Memorize what's on the slide. There will be an art for art's sake question. This artwork may be on there. This artwork may not be on there. But you should be able to tell me that it's art for art's sake and what that means. Okay? I think that's the end of it, thank goodness. Have a good time.